Welcome back to another lesson on periodic trends. This time we focus on ionization energy and electronegativity. Those are some pretty big and intimidating chemistry words. But today I'll not only define them, but talk about how these properties can influence the way an atom behaves. We'll also see how these properties vary based on an element's position on the periodic table. So you should keep your periodic table close by. The word ionize, or ionization, is made of two parts. Ion, an atom that has lost an electron, thus become charged. And ize, which is also found in words like socialize, legalize, or atomize. If you socialize someone, you make them social. If you legalize something, you make it legal. So when you ionize something, you turn it from an atom to an ion. Specifically, you're taking away its electrons. So ionization energy is defined as the amount of energy required to remove the outer electron in an atom. When talking about periodic trends, we're looking for patterns on the periodic table that allow us to predict properties of an element. So let's begin with a pattern you'd observe as you go down a group on the periodic table. Remember, a group is a vertical column on the table. To examine this pattern, let's use a graph of ionization energies along with our periodic table. This graph, which contains the ionization energies for the first 20 elements, shows a pattern among those elements. We'll focus our attention on a few of the noble gases. Notice as you go from element 2 to element 10 and on to element 18, the ionization energy goes from around 2400 kilojoules to 2100 kilojoules and then to about 1500 kilojoules. So we'll say as you move down a group, the ionization energy decreases. Now how about as you go left to right across a period of the periodic table? Using a graph of ionization energy and our periodic table, let's see if we can find a pattern. I'm going to focus my attention on the period two elements. Notice that elements three through ten, that's lithium up to neon, they do show a general pattern. As you go across the period, the ionization energy increases, though not continuously. There are a couple places along this line where the trend reverses, but generally speaking, we could say that the ionization energy increases as you go left to right across the periodic table. But now, let's look at the explanation. You see, knowing the trend is only half of your understanding. I want you to understand why the trend occurs. And for this, we'll model a few of the elements found in group 18 on the periodic table helium, neon, and argon. Recall that helium has two protons, neon has 10 protons, and argon has 18. Helium also has two electrons in its first shell, while neon has two in the first shell and eight in the second. Argon has two electrons in the first shell, eight in the second, and eight in the third. Now let's consider why the ionization energy decreases as we go down the periodic table. To ionize helium, we must remove this electron here, pulling that electron until it's no longer attracted to the nucleus. For neon, we remove an electron that's a little further away. And then in argon, the valence electron that's removed is even farther away. Because argon's valence electron is so much farther from the nucleus, it is not held as tightly, and thus, it's easier to remove. I liken this behavior to a game I used to play as a camp counselor, a game that was modeled after Capture the Flag. In this game, frisbees were placed around a circle, while a counselor or two was posted in the middle of the circle to guard the frisbees. Then, hundreds of kids were sent over into enemy territory to attempt to snatch frisbees from their opponent. The winner was the team that snagged all the Frisbees from the other team first. Now, as one of the camp counselor guards, I quickly discovered it was a lot harder to hold on to the Frisbees when they were placed far away. In the same way, 
it's a lot harder for an atom's nucleus to hold on to electrons that are farther away than those that are close. And so this electron in argon is relatively easy to remove, and it has a low ionization energy, while this electron in helium is harder to remove because of how close it is to the nucleus. Thus, helium has a higher ionization energy. Now, we should also discuss the pattern of ionization energy when going left to right on the periodic table. For this, we'll look at atoms with 8, 9, and 10 protons. These atoms are named oxygen, fluorine, and neon. Remember that if an atom has 8 protons, it will also have 8 electrons. 2 in the first shell and 6 in the second shell. Fluorine has 9 electrons, 2 in the first shell and 7 in the second shell. And then we have neon with 10 electrons. We saw this trend. As you move left to right, the ionization energy increases. Now why would that be true? Well, there are two explanations for this. First, notice the distance of the electrons. Remember from before that odd trend that says, as we move to the right on the periodic table, an atom gets smaller? This occurs because with each additional electron added to the shell, there's also another proton in the nucleus, pulling that outer shell closer. So the position of the outer electron in neon is closer to the nucleus than the position of fluorine's outer electron, which is also closer than oxygen's. So looking at distance, it would make sense that neon's electron would be harder to remove. Thus, it has a higher ionization energy. And there's another factor at play here, too. Neon has 10 positive protons pulling on its electrons, while fluorine only has 9 and oxygen 8. We say neon has the highest nuclear charge in this period. So to ionize neon, we need to pull an electron away from a nucleus that has 10 protons. And that electron is relatively close to the nucleus, too. The result is that neon has a high ionization energy. Now let's add these trends to our periodic table. Where there's room on your table, add a couple of arrows and note that as you move down the periodic table, the ionization energy decreases. And as you move left to right on the periodic table, ionization energy increases. We're going to practice what we just learned. Which element has the higher ionization energy, sodium or silicon, and why? Pause the video and see if you can explain the answer to this question. In a moment, we'll compare answers. Okay, let's compare. It's silicon that has the higher ionization energy. If you said this was true because it's to the right on the periodic table, that's not good enough. Although that's true, we want to explain this pattern using the structure of the atom. And you have two possible explanations you could use. You could say silicon has more nuclear charge or more protons. You could also say that silicon's electrons are closer to the nucleus. Both of these explain why it's so difficult to remove silicon's electrons compared to sodium's and why silicon then has a higher ionization energy. Now we'll consider successive ionization energy, removing one after another after another of an atom's electrons. As each additional electron is taken from a boron atom, let's notice what happens to the ionization energy. And let's focus our attention on these valence electrons out here as we successively ionize boron. We remove the first electron, and it costs 800 kilojoules of energy. Notice that in this process, the radius of the electron shell is reduced. This occurs because now there's less repulsion between electrons here. The second electron that's removed requires even more energy, about 2400 kilojoules of energy. And the third, even more energy. That's because with each ionization, the remaining electrons move in closer to the nucleus. So as you may have guessed, while removing each additional electron, the ionization energy gets higher and higher. Now the interesting thing I want you to notice is the fourth ionization. 
You can see from the table that each successive ionization increases by around 1,000 kilojoules. But check this out. The fourth ionization jumps up to 25,000 kilojoules per mole. So how do we explain this? Why the big jump when we do the fourth ionization for a boron atom? Well, let's consider what we did. Boron is an atom with three valence electrons, and removing each of these electrons required around 1,000 to 3,000 kilojoules of energy. However, once the valence electrons are gone, we have to dig into the inner shell of electrons. On the fourth ionization, then, we see a huge jump in ionization energy. This is explained by the fact that this electron is so much closer to the nucleus. Now you try an example. I have a picture on the right side here that shows Bohr's model of a silicon atom. And over here I have a shorthand notation called a Lewis dot diagram, which shows just the valence electrons as dots. Let's use what we know about silicon to figure out which ionization will show a large jump in ionization energy. And let's see if we can explain why. Pause the video and come up with your own answer to this. We'll compare in just a moment. If you said the fourth ionization shows a big jump, you were pretty close, but that's not the correct answer. You see, the first ionization requires some energy, and the second requires even more, the third and the fourth ionization take still more energy, but it's on the fifth ionization that there's a huge jump in ionization energy. It's because on the fifth ionization, we pull off an electron that is much closer to the nucleus. Here, we remove a core electron. And now we'll talk about our final periodic trend, the trend of electronegativity. This term is long and intimidating, but it's a very important concept in chemistry. So let me give you a simple definition for this. Electronegativity is the pull of an atom on its electron while it's bonding. And I do want to highlight these last words, while bonding. This is important because it means we'll not discuss electronegativity for one of the families that never bonds. And the family that never bonds is the one that already has a full set of valence electrons, the noble gases. To determine the most electronegative elements, or those that I call the electron hogs, we're looking for atoms that have small radii with more protons. Those tend to be the biggest electron hogs. So let's compare lithium to fluorine. And we notice that both of these atoms have two shells of electrons. Fluorine, however, is a bit smaller, and it has a higher nuclear charge than lithium. For these two reasons, fluorine pulls its electrons better than lithium, and so it has a higher electronegativity. This illustrates the general trend observed on the periodic table. The elements on the right side tend to have a higher electronegativity than the elements that are on the left. Now let's compare lithium to the element just underneath it on the periodic table, sodium. Here we have two competing ideas that must be considered. The first idea is that sodium might have a higher electronegativity because it has more protons and a higher nuclear charge. This means it should pull electrons better. It makes sense that sodium might have a high electronegativity. But in fact, sodium's electronegativity is lower than lithium's. How could this be? Sodium has 11 protons and lithium only has 3. Well, the reason for this has to do with the radius. Yes, sodium does have more protons, but its electrons are also much farther. And as it turns out, the number of protons is not as important a factor as the distance to the electrons. So the best way to explain why sodium has a smaller electronegativity than lithium is to say it's because of the distance to the electrons. Sodium has an extra electron shell, so it doesn't pull electrons as well. So let's add this trend to your periodic table. Where there's room on your periodic table, and I know we're running out, let's make a couple more arrows and label these to show that as you move down the periodic table, the electronegativity decreases, and as you move left to right on the periodic table, electronegativity increases. 
Based on that, you should know that the element that is the most electronegative, or the biggest electron hog, is fluorine. And not far behind fluorine is oxygen, which is closely followed by nitrogen and chlorine. These four elements are fairly easy to remember if you just make a little phone call. In other words, the elements with the highest electronegativity in order are fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, and chlorine. Phone call. We'll wrap this lesson up with a quick check. We're going to put these elements in order of decreasing electronegativity. Put the most electronegative element first and the least electronegative element last. Pause the video and try this on your own, then we'll compare answers. Well, I got fluorine is first, followed by oxygen, then boron, which is higher than magnesium, and then the least electronegative element on the list, strontium. I hope you learned some new things about ionization energy and electronegativity, and that these words aren't so scary anymore. I also hope you learned how to determine these properties of elements based on where the elements appear on the periodic table. Good luck as you complete your periodic trend assignments.